What's going on ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Brad, back with another video. And what I wanted to do in this one is kind of give you guys a, a day in the life, a typical shift of a cardiothoracic surgical ICU nurse. Are you listening? Nurse Pass. Beast mode. Grinding. Yeah. Yeah. So before I get into like what a typical shift looks like, let me first tell you kind of what I do, my role uh, in the ICU. So basically what we do is we recover fresh post-op open heart patients right there on the department. They don't come to the, they don't go to the PACU first, they come directly to us and we recover them there. Now these patient populations can have all kinds of different surgeries, you know, cabbages, replacing valves, vat implantations, there's a lot of different things that can be done. Uh, as well as some vats and other thoracic surgeries. Regardless, they come back to us and we recover them right there in the ICU. So usually whenever they first come back to us, they're relatively hemodynamically unstable. There's a lot of chaos and commotion that's going on in that initial hour, if you will, switching them over to our monitors, uh, collecting urine output, chest tube output, making sure that they're not bleeding too much getting an initial set of labs, um, chem eight, making sure that their electrolyte status is uh, appropriate, if they need potassium re repleted, what have you, getting ABGs, making sure that their oxygenation status is appropriate, so on and so forth. A lot of stuff goes on in that initial hour. So once that initial hour is over, essentially what you're doing is you are managing this patient's hemodynamic status, making sure that you get them appropriately set up for extubation and prepared for success. So a lot of times these patients come back on a lot of different drips. Uh, we got drips for sedation, such as Presidex, that's typically what we see. Um, vasoactive medications, whether it be nitro or neo or something like levo, depending on their status, whether they're hypo or hypertensive. You may also have some positive inotropes, such as milrinone. You could be looking at something like amio if the patient has uh, issues with atrial arrhythmias. Sometimes they're on low dose dopamine. There's just a lot of different drips that you're responsible for managing, making sure that the patient has enough medication, and also ensuring that you're titrating appropriately to keep the patient within specified, defined parameters. So a lot of times we have MAP goals, I mean arterial pressure goals of 70 to 90. That's typically the range that we want to keep our patients in. And so there's a lot of management of these drips and also pacers, external pacers, epicardial pacers, in order to make sure that we maintain this patient's blood pressure right where we need it to be. You don't want their blood pressure to be too high and run the risk of blowing the anastomosis uh, sites, you know, at the, if they had a cabbage blowing the anastomotic sites. You also don't want it to be too low because you want to ensure that they're still getting coronary perfusion. So most times what we have are we have volume issues with these patients. A lot of times they just need volume. Their, their tank is kind of dry. So what we end up doing is we end up giving albumin, we end up giving LR things to pull fluid into the intravascular compartment, really pump up that blood pressure, also in conjunction with vasopressors. The biggest thing is making sure that we get these patients as stable as we can before we begin weaning off sedation, waking them up, and then coaching them through the process of getting the breathing tube removed, getting extubated. Now, of course, not every single patient that comes back is clear cut, dry, perfect across the board, just a couple of easy titrations of the meds and, and weaning off sedation. A lot of times, whenever they come back, like I said, their blood pressure can be kind of labile, so you're giving albumin, you know, you're getting CBC sometimes if their chest tube output is too great, they're bleeding too much, they're losing volume, their hemoglobin or hematocrit's going down, you may be transfusing blood products, things of that nature. There's protocols in place for almost everything, and bleeding is one of the things. So if they're having too much bleeding from uh, their chest tubes, you know, there's a different, different protocols that you go along with that. So that's just another little piece of component of the process of recovering these fresh post-op hearts. But regardless of all of that, let's say we get their volume status uh, on board, we, we get get them tanked up. Uh, we're now easily able to manage our blood pressure with our drips. They're easily titratable. We start weaning off sedation and waking the patient up. And as long as there's no hiccups along the way, such as you know whenever patients wake up from sedation, you know a lot of times they don't know where they are. They may not know what's going on. They may be agitated. They have a breathing tube in, and as they wake up more, they start gagging on the breathing tube. So there's a lot of things that you're managing with this patient. Pain is another big thing, so it's kind of a fine balance of weaning sedation and waking the patient up, making sure that their pain is still treated, making sure that they still remain in a calm state of mind so that you can get that breathing tube out, and make sh making sure that they're set up for success from a respiratory standpoint, because the last thing that you want to do is have a patient who's too sleepy or whatever, you take that breathing tube out, then you end up having to put it right back in. I say all that to say, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is phenomenal. 
I mean, it is like what these nurses do on a day to day basis is phenomenal because whenever you think about it and you think about what you're actually in there doing, helping recover these fresh post-op patients, getting them set up for success hemodynamically speaking, and then winning sedation and getting that breathing tube out. It's awesome, man. It is. And then once you get the breathing tube out, you know, there's a whole nother range of things that you have to do. You know, you work on turning, coughing, deep breathing, working on incentive spirometer to make sure that they don't develop post-op pneumonia, things of that nature, getting them dangled, um, really helping those lungs expand, things of that nature. It's awesome. And then of course, you know, like I said, you're monitoring urine, you're monitoring uh, chest tube output. I didn't even get into any kind of intense cardiac uh, hemodynamic monitoring, such as uh, pulmonary artery pressures, cardiac indexes, things of that nature. But there's a lot of things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, which like I said, it's just phenomenal. And I really look back, I put a post up on Instagram today, actually, uh, August 13th, it kind of talking about how four years ago, I had just gotten my CNA certif cert certificate. I hadn't even applied to nursing school yet or anything. I had just gotten my CNA certificate four years ago. And today, here I am, four years later, doing all of these crazy things that I just described to you. And it's, it's really awesome. And I really kind of want that to be a testimony to you guys to say, I made that leap in only four years. That's, that's no anatomy and physiology, no understanding of the human body, barely being able to, you know, check a manual blood pressure. And now we're doing all of this awesome stuff, awesome work, setting patients up for success in life. It's great, man. It's great. Patients come in very bad off a lot of times. A lot of times it's emergency situations, they come in with STEMIs or whatever, get cast, get worked up, realize they have vessel disease and need cabbages. They need, they need vessels replaced or, or whatever the situation may be. And then you take that very bad situation and then you turn it around into a positive thing. Now the outcomes aren't always positive, of course, but a lot of times they are. And it's a great thing to see. And then you see, I mean, it's truly a, it's truly an area within nursing where these patients, I don't know, it's, you know, they often say that nursing is a thankless profession a lot of times, and a lot of times it is, but in this area, in this particular niche of nursing, you get a lot of thank yous, man. And, it's, and, and I don't say it like I want people to be appreciative of what I'm doing, but it's just a thing where patients know how bad off they are. They know what all you're doing to get them squared away and and they're very thankful for it. And so all around full circle, it's just it's just a blessing to be able to do this kind of work. So I kind of wanted to give you guys just a little quick rundown. I'm sorry that it was word vomit. And I know a lot of that stuff for a lot of you guys out there who may be nursing students may like be like, what in the world did he just say? But I also, again, want that to be a testament, man. Four years ago, I could barely check a manual blood pressure. And, and look at all of the things that I just spilled to you that I know now that's just like this. So... You can do it, guys. Like I said in my Instagram post, whenever you're sitting there and you're in prerequisites or you're about to be going into nursing school or whatever your situation is, you, I want you to be looking at that mountain. That mountain that you're looking at that you have to go over can seem so immense and, and so hard. Like, I don't know how I'm ever going to get there. It's possible, man. It can be done. If I can do it, you can do it. It's a matter of how bad you want it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. I put out content every week to motivate, uplift, and inspire you to be the best you can be. It's your boy, Nurse Bass, and I'll catch you in the next video, baby. Peace.